Okay, a little bit of background um, about myself and, and our family and our farm. This is where we are located. Um, the probably not very visible there, but the star on the, in the sort of north central part of the state there um, is Calio, Missouri. We are an hour north of Columbia, two hours east of St. Joseph, Missouri. And this is our little piece of paradise there, um, just south of Highway 36. The uh, area in yellow there is the total outline of the farm. Um, and then the area in red um, is the ground that was used for this particular study for the uh, grazing of annual crops using lambs. And our um, farm family consists of myself, my wife, Cherie. Um, we have three children. Here's the crew. Um, Gregory, who came with me today for a little trip to Iowa. Um, this is Rebecca. And um, that's Abby there, along with uh, my wife, Cherie, and myself. I grew up on a dairy farm near Maryville, Missouri, Northwest Missouri, um, relatively small dairy farm, but my parents were full-time on the farm. Um, predominantly grass-based, talk a little bit more about grazing and grazing philosophy here in a minute. We, uh, my wife and I have raised sheep since 1996. We got our start with um, three St. Croix ewes. Um, it was our first introduction to hair sheep. Um, we purchased those from a friend. Started using Katahdin rams, um, learned a little more about the Katahdins, ultimately got interested in and began raising purebred Katahdin sheep, which is a hair sheep or a shedding um, sheep breed. We've been on our present farm since 1998. The farm was in my wife's family before that. Her grandparents and great-grandparents both lived in the area. Um, and so we just had a chance to move back after about 12 years after they had, had left the farm and moved where some of their other children were living. We continue to raise sheep there. We have had um, up to about 35 cow-calf pairs there. Um, it sold most of the cows, uh, I guess, two years ago, two and a half years ago now. Um, kept just a few, kept three cows, to be specific, um, for ourselves and, and some friends we sell beef to. And then um, the kids have a couple Berkshire sows, and they show pigs for 4-H as well as um, showing breeding stock sheep um, for 4-H and FFA. As I said, our sheep are Katahdins, a um, shedding breed, and we have, have had as many as 100 ewes. Right now we have 50 ewes. We'll lamb 50 ewes out um, this spring. We do lamb um, between January and March, um, just starting to lamb right now. And part of the reason for that, we've lambed anywhere from January to June. Um, and the reason we have settled predominantly on lambing in January to March is because of our ability to manage parasites on pasture. Um, we feel that if, you know, we get the lambs on the ground um, in a barn or a lot situation, get them up, get a little growth on them, and a little hardiness and immunity built in them, um, then we can either wean them onto pasture at that point, um, or if, you know, if, if we want to sell lightweight feeder lambs, we can do so. Um, we can move the ewes out to some of our rougher, more distant pastures. Um, if we choose to do that um, once the, the cool season grasses start to come on strong in the, in the spring. We end up selling most of our lambs, or what you might call a feeder lamb weight, um, post weaning um, anywhere through the end of the year on into the next spring. And so we will keep and finish, um, you know, I say finish, but just essentially grow out and sell some feeder lambs, or excuse me, some, uh, some finished freezer lambs. Otherwise, most of our lambs either go to an auction or they go to another individual who is raising um, grass-finished lamb um, and, and marketing, marketing and, as such.
The other reason for the earlier lambing, um, our kids do right now being in 4-H and FFA, they show uh, breeding stock. And so uh, to get lambs that are big enough um, to show and perform well at the county fair and state fair, um, we just have about have to lamb that early. Um, it's showing it's not a primary focus. It is a good marketing tool, a good way to get the sheep seen out there in the world and, and make people a little more aware of them. We do use a combination of feeding, and that takes me into the to my philosophy on forage utilization. Um, since I'm following a, a grass-fed um, beef producer in presentation, um, since many of you have a long history, lots of experience um, in, in forage utilization, raising grass-based or grass-finished animals, I just want to be clear. Um, and that is that I'm a pragmatist when it comes to forage utilization and not a purist. That is, philosophically, fully in support of grass um, finishing and grass feeding. Um, and in a perfect world, sheep being a ruminant animal, um, if I had high quality forages, or it was cost effective to um, improve my forages, um, I would be, I would love to be entirely grass based. Um, in our experience, um, economically, we have not been able to go to a fully pasture-based, fully forage-based system um, and produce animals that, that will, will get to a desirable weight, desirable condition and finish um, and market on a regular basis, again, while managing parasites and dealing with all of the other issues. So we do end up feeding some grain and the amount of grain we feed depends on the quality of forage that we have, both growing forage and harvested forage. Um, and, you know, I, I don't market grass-fed lamb or market my lamb um, as such. The, as I mentioned, the other individual that buys from me is marketing grass finished. So she has to own the lambs and, and finish them on grass for a certain period of time per her marketing claims that she is using. Now, from a sustainability standpoint, a personal preference standpoint, um, I do like utilizing as much forage as possible and talk more about that just based on the part of the country that we are in. Um, we have you know, primarily highly erodible ground, heavily eroded topsoils um, with high clay content, and a lot of ground that we used to have more CRP acreage. Of course, a lot of the CRP acreage has come out, um, is being cropped once again with, with the high crop prices we've had um, in the last few years. The motivating opportunity for the grant um, and for the study that I'm presenting about came when um, a neighbor was retiring. Um, he had already sold us um, part of his pasture. He was wanting to get out of farming all completely, uh, move closer to his children. And so before he did that, he was looking just to rent out the crop ground that, that he still had and was still utilizing. And so there was essentially um, about 28 acres, 17 acres being um, ground that he had cropped as most recently half of it in corn, half in soybeans. And it presented an opportunity to cash rent that ground and then um, try to answer these two questions. What forages can support nutritional needs of rapidly growing lambs, especially in the summer slump period we tend to face where um, our, you know, especially heavily fescue dominant pastures, endophyte infected fescue, um, when, it, when it is either in a, a slump or highly toxic to the animals as they attempt to graze it. So what can support the nutritional needs of these growing lambs? And then can the economic returns from grazing um, livestock in general and lambs in particular um, be sufficient to keep some of this marginal, highly erodible land in um, forage crops rather than, than in um, annual row crops only? This is the ground we're talking about. And you can see um, the gully erosion there. It's, it's quite obvious. Um, throughout the field there. Um, these soils are heavily weathered um, and in our county in general, high crop prices that we saw um, in the, you know, the, the in going back two years in, in that three to three to five years preceding that um, had caused additional conversion, um, an increase of 36% in corn acreage, slight increase in soybean acreage in the county and I just pulled out the 2000 and 2010 ag census numbers um, when we wrote our grant proposal originally back in 2012. In terms of unique 
challenges of raising lambs on forage, um, I say unique because, of course, a lot of, you know, there are many challenges to raising any livestock on forage, um, but I think raising sheep does carry some additional challenge in terms, especially in terms of parasite management, in terms of fencing. And so, you know, the general challenge, you can just sort of see from the condition of the pastures there, the same, um, same field those animals are in. Now, the one is a fall picture. picture. Um, the one on the right is a fall picture, but um, in northern Missouri, the saying is you're two weeks away from a drought um, at any point in time. You tend to have very tight soils. Water infiltr infiltration is very poor. Um, and so we can go from relatively lush pastures to, to looking um, you know, like you're in the Asian steppes in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, in terms of fencing, um, using portable fencing has challenges with sheep. I have a few fencing pictures later on, but um, you either, for, in our area, for portable fencing, people, for sheep, either, people either end up using netting, um, which is relatively expensive, electro netting, it's fairly expensive, um, fairly difficult and time consuming to move or some um, co combinations of polywire and, and permanent fencing. And so that can create some additional challenges. Other challenges to raising lambs on annual forages that I have found, um, my sheep at least don't like to go where they can't see. And so um, using something like sorghum sedan grass um, that, you know, if, if you're trying to avoid any prussic acid concerns, you want to let it get some height on it. Um, it can, can hit a growth spurt and quickly get over the sheep's head and then they really don't like to go out in it because they don't know quite what's out there waiting for them. And so the sheep tend to like to eat around the edge and they just sort of travel the perimeter of those fields. So I was interested in, in looking at some other forages that might address that summer need. Um, this is, uh, Joan had said, this was also a humbling experience for me. It just reminded me how dependent we are on weather. Um, and so in our proposal, we had a fairly ambitious plan to compare several forages um, due to weather conditions we'll talk about. What we ended up being able to look at and, and gather data on was primarily just our spring production of oats. Um, we did attempt um, to, to uh, look a little bit at teff grass. We never got the moisture to germinate the teff seed um, once planted. So yeah, I think everyone is, is quite familiar with oats. Um, we were very pleased with it, and I'll show the data that we found on the economics of utilizing oats. Teff grass, which you may or may not be familiar with, is a, a C4 grass, a warm season grass. The reason I was especially excited about it for sheep, um, again, my experience with sorghum sedan is that, um, you know, of course, sheep would eat on the leaves, but but you know the, the stem is relatively thick. They do not utilize it to the same, same extent that cattle will. Teff grass has a very fine blade. Um, it's, it's just a more, much more delicate grass in terms of, of its appearance. Um, palatability is quite high. It's very drought tolerant. And so you know, I was excited about this. Also very rather low growing. And so sheep are going to be more likely to, to uh, better utilize it, it seemed to me. And if you do, if you have questions that come to mind as I go through, feel free to go ahead and ask those. If, if you don't want to save that until the end, I'd be happy to answer those as we go. The lease on the ground um, was obtained in December of 2012. Um, we were past the point where we could plant any uh, winter annual crops to utilize. And so you know, once we found out that we that we had received the funding for the grant, the plan was to go ahead. The plan was to go ahead and plant oats as early in the spring as feasible. And then um, after grazing or harvesting the oats, um, go ahead and util utilize some different warm season annuals to follow up. Um, the oats were planted um, April 5th using a rented drill there from uh, NRCS. And two, I know there were presentations earlier in the forum from others about the, the 2013 year. Of course, weather varied depending where you were. Um, but our situation, we had an extremely wet spring, very heavy rainfall in April, um, relatively wet May, and then the spigot turned off and, and we turned, went back into a really dry summer pattern um, similar to, to what 2012 was in our area. But early on, we were cool and wet. And so in April, um, we planted those oats, and they just 
kind of set there. They didn't do a whole lot. That was, there's April 5th, and there's April 29th. It doesn't look a whole lot different other than a few more ditches out there. Um, April 29 again. And finally, um, we're getting close in, in May. We were, late May, we were able to begin grazing. But we were almost um, getting almost to the point 60 days out from our oat planting, which before we were able to, to graze, which was longer than we had anticipated. We took our um, pre-grazing study weights on May 22nd. The date on the picture there is, is June 29th because it's, this is a picture from the, the post-grazing weights, but just to show you the scale platform and our approach there. And then we began grazing oats on May 25th. Um, you can see the, the difference once they took off. Of course, they grew very rapidly. Um, there was still bare ground out there. Um, some of that ground had been subject to erosion from those heavy rains, but um, the, the cover was pretty good and the, and the growth was very good at that point in time. And our approach to grazing was to strip graze the oats um, and the animals were able to regraze, they were able to travel back over the ground they grazed um, for a certain point of time until we got to a bend where then we could put a fence behind and um, and keep them from grazing back over that ground. And so here we see the animals moving out on May 25th. It's the same, same field just a day later there and you can see the extent to which they've, they've already knocked down the, whoa. Is there, is there a pointer? Is that the? There should be a pointer. In the middle? You may have to get out. Oh, there, okay. Yeah. So you can um, probably see the extent to which they've already um, they've heavily grazed there in that foreground area. What we had available um, for the study, we had 48 lactating ewes, um, 85 lambs. Some, we, at this point, we had, had already sold a few ewe lambs, and then the lambs that the kids were going to show, um, we did keep up, and we were continuing to feed them, and they were working with those lambs, so that reduced the number of lambs available. Um, the lambs at the time the grazing study began were 77 days old, um, average weight of 49 pounds. So the lambs were old enough to wean, certainly they could have been weaned. Our choice to go ahead and leave the ewes out there was simply that we had, with once we hit that flush of growth, um, there was a tremendous amount of dry matter out there in the oats to be utilized. And so chose to just go ahead and take all of the animals we had, put them out there, um, let the lambs continue nursing the ewes during this, the grazing study. In addition then there were 18 head of yearlings um, with no lambs at side, um, yearling ewes that were put out there with them. Um, they, were, they strip grazed on this nine acres for 35 days. Um, a total at the beginning there 13,408 pounds of animal live weight um, or using the uh, uh, conversion unit we had there, 21.9 animal units just based on the number of head of ewes and lambs. This is after one day of grazing there just to, to kind of show where, where the animals are biting and, and how much of a bite they're taking there, how far down they're taking that plant and how much trampling we're seeing there. This is after three days um, on that first allotted area. Um, at this point, we're just we're moving the animals back out so we can move our fences. Um, but especially early on there, the, the forage utilization is, is very good. I'll talk about our averages a little later, but um, the animals are not leaving a whole lot behind. At this point, they're, they're fairly hungry. I mean, they're um, certainly enjoying the oats. Um, <coughs> highly palatable at that point in time. Okay, then again, just to give a little sense, um, this is that same day, May 29th there, um, the area that they are moving on to, just to show the growth level there. Um, there are ewes and lambs grazing there, and you can see the electronetting we were using at that point in time for fencing. This is, just gives you a sense of the way that we rotated the animals through that pasture. And so the, the numbers, excuse me. The, 
the number one and number 16, um, this particular paddock they utilize on day one and day 16. In day two, they moved over here. They were able to, to graze back here for a little bit until we got the fence behind them there. And then just shows the way that they move through here down to this end and then back um, through again and back eventually back out of the field over here. Depending where they were in the field relative to our um, hydrants and, and water source there, they either had a portable tank with a float on it um, or we were hauling water to them. I know Janet that caught just the end of Janet's presentation earlier, but certainly this is an advantage of sheep. Um, they're very efficient at utilizing water, um, relatively low water intake as compared to cattle, especially when they're utilizing lush forages like those oats. Um, the daily water intake early on when it was cool is very low. Again, you know, there was a fair amount of bare ground out there even amongst the oats and, and so we saw a fair amount of annual weeds, weeds in quotations there because, you know, that's often the sheep's favorite thing, lamb's quarter in particular, um, these, you know, very high protein forbs that are available to them. Um, but certainly you had a variety of dock out there, um, common ragweed, giant ragweed that, um, they cleaned up right along with the oats as they went along. Okay, here we are on, on June 1st. Again, you can see the, the grazed ground behind them and what they're working on right now. Um, you see the growth continuing. We also used a, a clipping method here just to try to, just to monitor how much growth we were getting, how much dry matter production we we're getting from the oats. And so we did three clippings, three samples there. May 24th, June 3rd, June 21st. In each case, we took either three or four forage clippings from throughout the field and averaged those to try to get an average um, representative sample of, of uh, what was growing out there. Um, just used that quadrant, clipped everything within it, um, dried it down, and tested that. So on May 24th, um, there were a little over 1,600 pounds per acre dry matter present. June 3rd, 2,200 pounds. June 21st, 9,000 pounds. Okay, so what happened here? Well, not quite sure, frankly. A different person took the clippings um, on June 21st and took the other two. Maybe they got overzealous in what they were putting in the quadrant and out of the quadrant. So I'm, I'm willing to say that we may have overestimated production there on June 21st. Um, the other field, we ended up not grazing just be, you know, because of the amount of growth we were getting where we were there. We took a cutting of hay off of that. The hay that we actually harvested off of that was about 6,000 pounds, three tons um, of dry matter per acre. So that's probably a better estimate of what was produced in total out there is the 6,000 pounds than the 9,000. Okay, here we are June 6th, um, you know, a couple weeks into grazing now. Um, you can see that we're not seeing a whole lot of regrowth there. Eventually there will be some regrowth on the, what they grazed first. Um, you know, again, depending on the number of animals you have, you certainly could have regrazed um, some of, of that regrowth of oats there. This is, is dry matter production from the oats per day. So what we're looking at here is three different time intervals, April 5th to May 24th, May 24th, June 3rd, and June 3rd to 21st. So in, in that early season period there, um, from, from planting up to the time we began grazing, again, they weren't seeing a really ideal growth period. Um, the oats were producing um, about 35 pounds per day, per acre dry matter. Late May, early June, it only goes up to about 53 pounds. And then again, we see this real surge here um, in June when they really take off. Okay, June 13th, we're another week into the study now. Um, you're starting, certainly starting to see the stem thicken up there. Um, these oats are getting ready to flower. Um, palatability is going down, but utilization is, is still pretty good there. Okay, these are our weight gain results. So over um, a, a total, actually a total of a 38-day um, period, 
because we w took the initial weights on the 22nd, we didn't begin grazing until the 25th. That's the three-day difference there. But over the 38-day interval, um, these ewes and lambs grazing together, 85 lambs, 48 ewes. The lambs had a beginning average weight of 49 pounds. They gained a little over 16 pounds during that time period, um, which was 38% of their starting body weight and average daily gain of 0.43 pounds. The ewes, um, again, they're still lactating, um, so the lambs are getting a little bit of nutrition from the ewes as well. The ewes did lose a little bit of weight. They lost four pounds on average, 2.8% um, of body weight, 0.11 pounds per day. Um, that's, you know, that's a trade-off I'm happy to accept. The ewes were, were only lambing once a year. The ewe has a long time to go out there um, and regain that body weight and body condition um, over the summer and fall before she's rebred. Now, this 0.43 pounds per day, is that good or bad? Um, that's no, no grain supplementation, um, no concentrate feed supplementation of any kind. The comparable lambs, the, the kids show lambs, which you might say were the best, the, the fastest growing lambs in the bunch, that were getting some concentrate supplementation. Um, I think they average, their average gain was about 0.7 pounds. A Katahdin lamb, to me, on you know, pasture or anything, approaching a half pound per day is good. Um, on, even on feed, you know, our, our lambs rarely gain more than 0.7 to 0.9 pounds per day. So you know, I, was, I was happy with getting that gain there. And then the yearlings that were out there um, didn't gain, excuse me, didn't gain a whole lot. Um, certainly didn't lose weight. Their average daily gain, 0.13 pounds. Um, but they weren't, you know, at a point they were needing to grow. They're just they're at, at a slow growth point there anyway. Okay, and I should click past one picture there. Um, again, just to see where we are, June 17th now, um, you know, definitely starting to see flowering out there. Um, the, the, the plant is starting to mature. Now when the animals graze and, and they're walking down more of the crop that's out there, there's definitely more residue left. Um, the stem is thicker, leaves are a little less palatable, and you see the oats heading out there by June 19th. So we were also, we were estimating the amount of dry matter there just based on the height of the forage when we turned them into a new paddock and then looking at the residue that was left and trying to estimate the dry matter left when they came out. And so based on those, the measures that we took, um, we estimated that the sheep consumed um, gross across the whole flock there about 21, 22,000 pounds of dry matter um, or about 2,400 pounds per acre. So if there were, you know, something, again, you know, just based on the, uh, the, hay, clip, the hay cutting that we took, if there was something like 5,300 pounds out there, um, the forage utilization rate by the sheep across the whole study was about 45%, which, you know, again, I, considering the amount, the volume of forage there when they're turned in and the, and the trampling they're going to do, I think that's okay. The, the remaining organic matter is still there. Um, it's, it's helping to enrich the soil as it breaks down. Okay, this is June 24th, getting close to the end of the period there. Again, you can see kind of what is left out there. Um, in terms of, you know, the, end, the digestive health of the animal, their ability to handle that forage and the high water content in it, um, this is, is on June 3rd. Um, and so here, you know, you, you do have a pretty soft stool there um, that's left. So it does not look the best. Now this is um, about a week later, June 11th there, and now as, you know, as the crop is maturing a little bit, the animals are adjusting to it, certainly the, the fecal matter that was out there is much more normal in terms of um, composition, the way, it, the, the way it looks, and again, um, animal health was good during that time. We did, we uh, utilized the FAMACHA method um, in terms of parasitism and deworming. Um, so we anal analyze, we take a look at the animal's eyelid before we deworm, try to only deworm animals that need it. Um, we did not do any deworming of ewes or lambs during the study. Um, after, later in the summer, um, we did deworm lambs. 
but uh, during the study, parasitism was not an issue that we faced. Okay, now this again is this is July first. Here, the animals are this is basically last day in the pasture there. And then we we did utilize some cows to clean up some of the regrowth there before we wanted to try to plant our summer annual crops. Okay, overall, um, the nine acres that we grazed um, provided um, 25 animal unit months of grazing um, or basically 2.84 animal unit months per acre just based on the, the number of animals that we had in the area utilized there. The other eight acre field that was available by the time we had, had finished grazing that first nine acres it was in full flower um, so we went ahead and cut it um, in fact, it was it was in the dough stage by that point. Um, went ahead and cut it for hay on June 23rd, um, and that was the amount of hay that we harvested off of that field. We also compared in the in our written report we compared the cost of mowing, raking, and baling as compared to grazing. Um, grazing was a more cost effective way to utilize the forage, at least based on our on the average forage values, hay values in our area. Um, but still, it was a way to preserve that forage for later use. After we pulled the lambs off and after the hay was harvested, um, we did light to medium tillage there, um, a single pass disking and field cultivator um, to try to prepare a seed bed for the teff grass. Um, it's, if, you're familiar, if you are familiar with teff, it's an extremely tiny seed. Um, it does need a prepared seed bed, a quite smooth seed bed. And then um, we seeded that um, on July 1st using a brilliant seeder. Maybe, you know, probably we, in hindsight we were foolishly optimistic to expect to have a rain in July to germinate that teff seed, but um, I guess that's what we were hoping for. And unfortunately the, you know, the oats, the, which had grown very effectively, um, had also effectively sucked up most of the available topsoil moisture. And so the the teff went into a very dry seed bed, um, planted very shallow because of the small seed size. There was not more, um, there was not enough moisture there in the, in the top profile of the soil um, to germinate that seed. And then um, we turned very dry. And so we had no measurable precip um, in July or August after the teff was planted. Um, and, and even though it is drought tolerant, it does need some moisture for germination. And so we did not get a stand. That's what the field looked like um, in early September there. And mostly we had some pigweed, which the sheep were happy to eat, but there's very little teff grass out there. There's a little bit of a close-up where we did get some growth of the teff, um, but it was nothing that we were, we were able to utilize in any significant manner for um, grazing. Okay, some of the, the challenges um, of this study in particular and of, of grazing sheep and um, in these kinds of situations of you know, being solely grass-based with sheep. So certainly the fencing is a challenge and again, I didn't, did not get to hear, it sounded like you had some good, maybe had developed some good solutions for fencing um, with sheep in these situations. Um, I wasn't terribly happy with either the electronet um, or the poly wire, so we, in some cases we used Electronet that we had already um, and then we purchased polywire and step-in posts and tried three strands of polywire. Um, our uh, permanent electric fences are old brake cable, salvage brake cable, um, three wires um, on with combination of steel posts and fiberglass posts um, for electric fencing. We have pretty good luck with it. But with the polywire it, it, it either it comes up in low places or it sags enough that the lambs feel comfortable jumping through and then of course once they start jumping through um, it's very hard to stop them from doing so. So to utilize this effectively with lambs um, you know I would say you need to have them well fence trained in a relatively tight area and then hope that carries over. With an annual crop like this the poly wire was is very challenging to get it down. Um, the oats you know were 24 to 30 inches high by the time we're grazing some of them toward the end 
um, relatively stiff, and so to just you know to try to trample that down, get polywire moved to a new spot, or excuse me, get the electronet moved to a new spot was challenging. Same thing with the polywire; the oats would push up that top polywire and create places where the lambs could go through. If I were if I weren't a sheep producer already, or weren't committed to having sheep, and simply wanted to graze annuals using crop ground, you know, I would say grazing stalker calves is going to be uh, certainly a lot less headache. Um, and maybe more profitable because of the additional challenges of trying to fence sheep with portable fencing. Using annual cover crops, I would argue is better than not using cover crops, um, but relying on that annual planting um, still leaves the ground exposed to erosion um, at key times of the year. And of course our heavy rainfall time is going to be in that early spring period. And so, you know, I don't know that this is an ideal solution, but if you have relatively um, flat ground and can utilize oats in that situation, um, certainly our data showed that it can be done um, in a cost-effective way. In terms of the economics of the study, so across the time period, the, just the grazing study, the 38 days there that we evaluated gain, um, the lambs alone gained um, 1,382 pounds of weight, live animal weight. I, we valued that at $1.50 per pound, which was market price in our area at the auction. Um, land prices are, are a little higher now um, than then. So the, the value of that gain on the nine acres was $2,073 or $230 per acre, just from the, the oats. The expenses that we had, um, we had $130 per acre cash rent, um, $8 for the drill rental, um, $8 for the tractor charge per acre, um, $29 in fertilizer, $19 in seed. Is that five minutes? Okay. So $195 per acre in expenses just for the oats alone. This is no labor expense included, by the way. Um, so the net value of the oats per acre being grazed was $35 per acre. Now this is sort of a hypothetical. Again, we did not really get any benefit from the teff grass, and maybe it's foolish to think that you can come back with another annual after the oats and get that. If you had access to irrigation and you could get that teff up, I think the teff would have thrived in the summer, even in the drought conditions. Just that initial germination was our problem. But just for speculation here, if you said you could continue to get those gains for another 35 days later in the fall from the teff grass in late summer, um, and you get another $230 per acre. Your cash rent's already taken care of. This, these were the seed and establishment costs for the TEF. So that would give you another $158 per acre from grazing lambs on that same ground later in the season. So basically, the two combined, you'd come up to $194 net per acre. And then we just compared that to, I took corn because um, we talked about conversion of land, of erodible ground to corn production in our county. Um, I compared, um, again, excluding labor, but pre-harvest machinery, seed chemical fertilizer rent, um, and harvest costs for corn in our area at $510 per acre, and then gross revenue from corn at $3 a bushel, $4, $5, and $6 a bushel, and then the resulting net and if you, know, if you were able to get both a spring and summer fall annual grazing period using lambs, netting $194 per acre, again, it starts to look more competitive versus crop production, corn production in that case. Just a few other closing thoughts, I guess. Um, the other forage alternatives we looked at and that I've utilized elsewhere on the farm um, you know, and given the spring conditions we had, that very wet spring, very cool spring, it would have been nice to have a winter annual out there. And so this is the neighboring field and the same day, um, or all three days later, but almost the same time period there when our oats looked like that. Um, here's what some cereal rye looked like in the adjoining field um, that, that the sheep were on. And so, you know, that benefit from a winter annual in a, in a wet spring condition is very high. I don't think I have much time, but, but again, sorghum sedan, 
um, brown midrib sorghum and, and pearl millet are other things we either have utilized or I'm interested in trying to utilize in that same pattern um, with lambs in the future. In conclusion, um, based on our results, grazing annuals can be a profitable alternative to row crop production, but it definitely raises challenges. Timing is everything, um, especially relative to soil moisture and rainfall um, and getting those crops germinated. Labor is higher. Um, I didn't put labor in here, but, but I would say approximately two hours labor per acre over the grazing period is what we spent moving fence um, when you took out you know, the time of weighing the lambs and that sort of thing. Um, the grazing of cover crops can offer re erosion reduction on that highly erodible ground. And, and I think if you have especially small acreages, um, consider that grazing of annuals to fill in niches or um, provide some livestock forage at, at key times of the year. Finally, you know, I would say sometimes simple is better. Um, the TEF, it sounds really good. Um, it's quite expensive. The seed is quite expensive, and, and I think that's the issue. I find with a lot of the, the novel cover crops, the exciting ones, um, they have a pretty high price tag. And old tried and true things like oats and cereal rye and wheat, um, and some of the clovers are, you know, maybe much, much more cost effective and still provide reliable um, grazing source. So with that, I'd take any questions that there might be. Yeah, so he, he pointed out that there was no beginning value of lambs, a purchase value of lambs going into the, the cost. Um, yeah, and the reason being is that the only return I evaluated, I guess, was the net return from the weight they gained. It wasn't, I wasn't valuing their total weight, total body weight. I was just valuing the weight they gained. So that's kind of, I mean, you know, depending what, of course, the difference in per purchase, per pound purchase price and sale price at the end of the period, it might be better to, you know, take their starting value and ending value and put it in there. Okay. Yeah, so could, could the oats have been underseeded with something else at establishment or broadcast like clovers? Um, yes, I think that's a good point. And the main reason for not doing so in that case was just that Really, again, the TEF grass was the exciting thing to us, I think, to say, you know, what, what could TEF do for us in grazing lambs? And so I, in the oats, I was just looking for something to fill the spring niche until we could get the summer annuals planted. And so the, the oats were sort of an afterthought in the beginning, but they ended up being... Um, so you're also interested in, in other crops. So, for example, orchard grass, uh, seeding orchard grass with the clover initially to establish it, right, along with the oats. And then if we had had better early growth on the oats, um, would we have had different results, been able to utilize them longer? Yeah, so when we, by the time we were coming off of what, you know, I had marked as field one, field 16, um, there was there were probably six to eight inches of regrowth on the oats there. So if we had, had had a little earlier growth and been able to get into them earlier, I think we could have had, you know, enough second growth on the oats to probably graze through another time. Um, may have still, again, left us with, too little soil moisture to do anything else after them. What, you know, I mean, again, frankly, the, the grant aside, um, that particular piece of ground, I think, is best suited to perennial forages. And so, you know, we tried to get it seeded down that next year. Um, again, we ran into weather problems. Um, and then this fall, late in the fall, I seeded um, Timothy and orchard grass on that. And then I'm going to go in and broadcast clover into it this winter. Um, maybe next week when I, <laughs> if, if the weather continues to prevail. But anyway, I think that particular ground is better suited to perennial forages. Mm -hmm.